right, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well this evening or whether you, wherever you are located in the world, welcome to the Arthritis Foundation's very first webinar for 2024. I'm so excited to be here with you all. And today we will be focusing on a new year and a new mindset. I need this probably as much as you all do. And we will talk about reframing arthritis to build better habits. I think that we all can do better in the habits department. And this webinar is going to help provide us with the foundation that we need, I think, to move forward with that. So let me tell you just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Sherelle Moore Tucker. I also am a holistic wellness educator. And this is like a little small snippet from my own personal website. Um, I also have a nice little ebook on there that's free, Breathe In, Stress Out, to just share some tools and tips on how to reduce stress using affirmations and other mindfulness tools. And I really work with people that deal with chronic pain, just like myself. So I also, um, I'm a disabled veteran. I served in the United States Army and I unfortunately departed the military with some physical challenges like so many of you all. Um, I've been suffering with osteoarthritis for more than 10 years or so. So I definitely can relate to pain flares and just the ups and downs of life of someone that lives with chronic pain. So that's just a little bit about me. So I hope that you will go to my website, SherelleMoreTucker.com and learn more about me if you're interested. So before we really get into the program, we just have a few housekeeping rules. So just note that all attendees will be muted. Uh, we will have an opportunity for a Q&A as well. So stay, definitely stay tuned for that. And we're gonna have a short presentation with a brief discussion afterwards, which I think is really gonna be beneficial for all of us to just kind of hear this discussion. And after tonight's session, you'll receive an email asking you about your experience and you'll receive a post-event survey. Now this survey is really important, not only for the Arthritis Foundation, but also for you because we want to hear your feedback so the Arthritis Foundation can get your feedback and provide more webinars like this and tend to your questions and your needs. You can learn more about the Arthritis Foundation and this webinar, which will be um, available afterwards on the youtube.com backslash Arthritis Foundation. And you can also find this webinar um, on the webinars page on arthritis.org. Um, you can also register for upcoming webinars, which are hosted monthly on the Webinars Hub, and just be on the lookout for more information to help you live uh, a better life. We have our guest expert here, Dr. Laura Black, and let me just draw your attention to uh, her slide, and I'll tell you a little bit more about her. Dr. Laura Black is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health, and after completing her PhD at the University of Kansas, she completed her residency at the Albert School of Medicine at Brown University and fellowships at the Ohio State University and Cincinnati uh, Children's Hospital. After a faculty position at the University of Kansas Medical Center, Dr. Black returned to the Ohio State University in 2023 and currently works as a pain psychologist and research uh, director of an outpatient interdisciplinary pain rehabil rehabilitation clinic. And so let's all welcome Dr. Black and all that she's gonna share with us this evening. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I am Dr. Laura Black. I have been a pain psychologist for about the past six years, officially as a faculty member, but have had um, many years of experience working with ver people with various types of chronic health conditions. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about today um, is a little bit about using pain psychology principles, um, especially those from acceptance and commitment therapy to help frame kind of ways to maybe make some changes in the new year um, and, and kind of um, uh, get yourself ready to kind of attack 2024. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with just a few pain psychology basics. Okay, so I always like to start many of my talks with a few 
pain psychology, what it is, what it is not. I am actually going to start with what it is not. Um, so it's really important for me to let people know, one, in talks like this, two, in times that I'm just speaking to people, and three, whenever people find themselves in my office after a referral, that people know that pain psychology is not for, quote unquote, crazy people, um, and it's not aimed at getting rid of the pain. And so what I mean by that is, one, if you have chronic pain, that doesn't inherently make you crazy or mean that you have any sort of mental health disorder or emotional problems. It, pain itself is pretty frustrating, pretty stressful, and we can always use some help in figuring how to do that better. Doesn't mean you're crazy. Also, unfortunately, talking to someone like me or talking to another pain psychologist will not magically make your pain go away. Um, I always make the terrible joke in my office that if I had a magic wand that would make your pain all go away, I would have a much better office, a much cooler office and a much nicer car. But unfortunately, I do not. Um, but what I can do and what pain psychology is focused on, at least in some part, is helping people develop and really grow the coping skills that they already have um, and help you learn a few more help people get a more um, increased sense of control over their life, over their symptoms, over kind of where they want to move forward um, in their life, all with this really big goal of increasing quality of life and function and making sure that whatever that looks like to that particular person, that's what we're tailoring all of this for. It's not a one size fits all. There's definitely some, some basics and some themes and some sort of common things that we talk about but everyone is different. And that's kind of the fun thing for what I do is everyone brings something different to the table. And this way, whatever your quality of life is, however you increase that, whatever function means to you, those are the things that we can talk about to kind of tailor some of these things. I love this slide. Um, so I want to take a step back for just a minute and everyone's going to get a little bit of primer about what um, or a little bit of education on what pain is, um, the actual physiological sensations that happen in pain. And it's really important to take a one step back and get a really small biology lesson because it helps frame why psychology can be helpful and involved in um, chronic health and chronic pain management. So I'm going to I'm going to talk off the slide for a minute, but what I want to do is start with what actually goes on in the body and in the brain when people experience pain. But I want to start with what happens when you experience sort of acute um, pain, not chronic pain. So acute pain is something like an injury or whatnot is the example that I'm going to use. So if I was walking around my office here and I stub my toe on my desk, what would happen is a sensation would go up my toe, up my foot. Um, leg, spinal column, brain, it would ping pong in a couple of different areas of my brain, and then it would finally land in one part of the brain associated with that toe. And then just in that part, that's whenever the sensation of pain is created. It's not until it gets up here, right? And also, it's important to know that in that moment, your brain is doing a lot of problem solving. It's trying to figure out how dangerous this is, what's going on, you know, all of these different things to figure out how big to make this pain signal. And so whenever that signaling is happening and all that ping ponging that's going on, the areas of their brain that it kind of takes a moment to, to, to process in are areas of the brain that are associated both with physical sensations and with mental things, with mental um, sensations, emotions, memories, fear, stress, all of that type of stuff. And so in and of itself, the, the actual sensation of pain is both physical and mental. It involves both things. Again, it's not a psychiatric condition. That pain is an actual physiological thing that is absolutely occurring. So pain is in your brain, but it's not in your head, which is a little bit confusing. Um, but that's exactly kind of how we think about things. But as I said, again, Areas of your brain that process thoughts and emotions are intricately tied in the areas of brains uh, in areas of the brain that process pain. So you're really doing uh, many people are doing a bit of a disservice to themselves if they're not taking into account kind of what we call the biopsychosocial model of pain. And honestly, providers are doing people a disservice if they're not taking all of those factors into consideration when providing um, care for pain and treatment for pain because it involves a whole lot of things and we want to get the whole body brain involved. So what does this mean? Um, and what that means is even without psychological conditions, those psychological factors, stress, anxiety, 
fear, depression, memories, all of these things play a role in pain processing and management. I could go on a whole nother talk. I have lots of PowerPoint slides about sort of the theories behind it and research that shows kind of how we can manip almost manipulate one in a way by manipulating the other. But the take home message is that you can't really look at pain in just a bubble with just the physiological sensation. It's, it's a whole bunch of brain areas that are involved and it's both emotions and phys physical sensations. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for us? What does that mean for the talk today? Well, it's important to realize that because the brain area, some brain areas that are responsible for more emotions and psychological factors play a role in pain perception, both acute and chronic, it's important to know that the way you respond impact, can impact the way that you experience pain, right? And so the, 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 some of the ways that we can use this to our advantage um, is that we can work on different response patterns. And it's hard. It's hard to experience pain, some people almost all the time, right? All day, every day. It's really hard to do something different. And I, I get that as much as I can as someone who doesn't experience it myself, but I work with people all the time with this. So my job is to help you think about ways and problem solve ways to see if you can do things a little bit different. And one thing that can be helpful is something called behavioral activation. Sounds super fancy. It's, it's pretty cool, but it doesn't need to be as fancy as it sounds. Basically what that is, is doing things that bring you joy, right? So many people that I talk to that have different types of chronic health conditions, that especially ones with pain, such as arthritis, your pain starts to take over at some point for many people and you stop doing the things that you like because it hurts to do the things that you like. So of course you take a step back and you don't do them as much. And so can we find ways to figure out ways for you to do that? And maybe it requires you doing some modifications, right? So if you are someone who loves taking big, long hikes, doing it you know, with family and, and kind of enjoying nature, Maybe your health limits how much you can do that, but can we find other ways to maybe scratch the same itch to some degree, right? Can you maybe go on a shorter hike? Can you maybe go for a small walk in the park? Can you do these things that still kind of get at the same joy, even if they have to be modified? And then looking at the next um, part of this, we're talking about acceptance. Acceptance can be very, very important in being able to modify those activities, right? Because by accepting arthritis or whatever the condition is, acknowledging that arthritis is a chronic condition and you're, you have the ability to build an action plan around that. And sometimes that action plan may be modifications. So this is where it you know, it can get a little confusing. So you're telling me that I should just accept the pain. Well, yes, but no, but not exactly. If you've ever met a psychologist, we don't like to give hard truths or, or not necessarily hard truths, but we don't like to give you hard yes or no's because it's usually somewhere in between, right? So with acceptance and commitment therapy, the idea of acceptance is that there are some things that we just can't quite change. These are things that the universe gave us and being able to accept them can sometimes open the doors for looking at things differently, for being able to make those modifications, for being able to adjust some things so that we can still do stuff, right? And so one of the things acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT um, talks about is a lot of the times whenever we start to not feel so good, either physically or emotionally or both, we can kind of fall into this, well, I'll be happy when, or my life will finally get better when um, my arthritis goes away or when my pain is better or when my depression lessens or whenever, you know, X, Y, and Z, you fill it in. And so that can keep us stuck, right? Because I don't think the arthritis is really going to necessarily get cured overnight. And so by getting kind of stuck in that pattern of I'll be happy when the pain is gone, I'll be happy when, the, you know, it's less, it makes it difficult to move forward. So instead, what ACT can help people do is turn that focus a little bit, one, acknowledge that there is pain and there is arthritis, 
and being able to move your focus um, on said more on what you can do and not necessarily what you can't do and all the limitations that you have from that. With that little bit of information about ACT, we I want to talk about using ACT principles for creating better habits. Um, it is the new year, right? So being able to make some better habits for 2024, but you don't have to do it in January. You can do it at any time. Um, and so we can use these principles to just kind of help learn how to do this a little bit more effectively. ACT basics for chronic conditions specifically. ACT if anyone has had any exposure to ACT, which is fine if you don't, um, I'm going to throw a lot of terms out. Um, I don't throw these terms out for anyone to think that they have to remember them. There will be no pop quiz, um, but more to let people get some exposure to what some of these things are so that if you find yourself in the situation that you can find an ACT therapist, this seems like something that's interesting to you, or there are... Um, widely available workbooks that you can use that you can kind of go through on yourself by yourself without a therapist necessarily that can walk you through some of this stuff just to give you an idea of like some of the things you're going to hear so that maybe you're you're ready for what's going to be um, coming down the pike with that. So some two fundamental concepts um, when I think about ACT basics for chronic conditions. One, acceptance of things that you cannot change, including difficult thoughts, feelings, and whoop, body sensations, right? Pain as well as understanding that acceptance allows you to commit and acting in ways that make you feel both vital and energized. That's our main goal, right? I want people that come to see me to feel like they're moving forward, that they feel like they are a per uh, the lead character in their life again, right? That they are actually the one being able to drive the bus. That's a metaphor that we use a lot. Um, and that they're not always just letting the pain make all of the decisions for them, as difficult as it can be. And so with uh, with along those lines, it's important, um, and one of kind of the key components of ACT is choosing some valued actions that you can try out, that you can focus on when you are experiencing pain. And for our purposes, it's it's a great thing. It's a great area of act to think about, right? Because that can show you, let's make some changes for the new year. So what are some valued actions you you can find? Um, and so these can be helpful for increasing um, behavior changes that maybe you've been wanting to try out or that your providers have been encouraging you to do. And also try to improve your functioning, right? We can always do a little bit better and and maybe find ways to do that. So more principles of ACT. So I use the word values a little bit. Um, values are, I'm going to be honest, one of my favorite part um, of ACT. I think it's critical to help people identify values to help guide what we do and what we focus on, right? So how you want to show up and interact with others and interact with challenges. Values are not goals. They are related to goals but they're different. Values are sort of these more overarching concepts um, and things in your life that are important to you, sort of guiding principles. They're things that can never be like fully achieved um, to some degree. So whereas goals, you can say, I want to, you know, by this time, I want to have had a different job and I want to have a promotion and et cetera, et cetera. Those are goals. But perhaps a related value would be, I want to be a valued member of the workforce. I want to be respected with my colleagues. I want to make a difference in my specific field, right? Those are values. You don't ever wake up one day and say, yep, I did that. I am now the most, you know, respected person and I really have, I'm done. Like I got a trophy and I'm done being that person. It's not that. Um, whereas the goals can build up in, to the values. Um, so examples, I talked about work a little bit, but exhibiting kindness and compassion, maintaining health and fitness, those are things that are more guiding principles. You don't wake up one day and say, yep, I've done it. I have been the kindest and most compassionate person there is. I'm all done. I don't have to keep working on that. Um, relatedly, committed actions or valued actions are any action, big or small, that are in service of those values that you have identified as being important to you. So valued actions can really serve as your compass for building these better habits that you want to maybe work on in your life. And it's really important to think about this because choosing actions that align with values make those habits 
more likely to stick around, right? If you want to change something in your life and you want to develop a, a better habit or whatever, but it's not important to you, it doesn't speak to a value that you have for yourself, there's very little motivation to keep it going, which is fine, right? Everyone's life is different. And whenever I talk to people, sometimes I say, you know, is this a, this is a problem for some people, but is it a problem for you? Because if it's not, or if it's not a value of yours, we're not going to go looking for problems. It's not important to focus our efforts in a place that is not valuable to you. So that's why choosing some different valued actions and, and habits that you want to change, having them relate to the big values that you have in your life are going to be very, very important. Next. So I am not going to read this entire slide. Um, but these are just some examples of values that have been taken from um, – different uh, worksheets and, and workbooks and things like that. But you can see they they range all the way from, you know, some big, st they're all big, but, you know, acceptance, open and accepting of myself and others and life, um, kindness, mindfulness, open-mindedness, patience, self-control, trust, right? There, There's a whole bunch of different ones. And part of what we can do in, in, in pain-focused act is take some of these values that people have had, see which ones ring really true to you, really hit for as important to you, how they relate, relate to your health and how they relate to your chronic pain. And then we kind of go from there. So as I said before, some other terms you may hear in ACT, again, you don't have to remember any of these, but I think that it's important to kind of get exposure a little bit to some of these terms. Um, so the main goal of ACT per the people that developed acceptance and commitment therapy is to increase psychological flexibility. And psychological flexibility in a nutshell um, is the ability to focus on the present moment and act in according to one's values, as we talked about before, while allowing some space for any sort of thoughts, emotions, bodily sensations to also exist. Even ones that we seem to feel that are unpleasant and unwanted, we let them be because that's where they are and we stay in the present moment and we kind of work on those valued actions. And so increasing psychological flexibility in includes all of these things, and I'll show you a diagram in just a little, in just a moment that's kind of shows you the, in a little bit of a graphical way. Um, but also something to keep in mind is with ACT, it is a little bit different than some other therapy, if you've ever been through it before, where it's very um, didactic. It's very experiential. So there's a lot of metaphors. I had mentioned, you know, talking about pain driving the bus. That is one of those metaphors that I use a lot. Um talking about playing tug of war, the, all of these things and what they are designed to do is kind of get you to look at some of these things in just a slightly different way. Also, we use a lot of experiential exercises. So different types of mindfulness, deep breathing, also thought exercises, emotion exercises, ways for you to just learn to associate with your thoughts, feelings, emotions, bodily sensations in a slightly different way. Again, it's not necessarily important that you remember all of this, but what this is, is this is um, one of the kind of the core parts of ACT on the more academic side. This is called the hexaflex. Um, and so what it is basically is showing how all of those different components, um, and some of them just sound, you know, they're kind of got fancy terms or kind of odd terms, self as context, obviously doesn't really make a, I even do this and to me, self as context kind of boggles my mind. But the idea that they all play together bi-directionally in all the different ways to help increase psychological flexibility, right? So acceptance of whatever experiences you're having and how that relates to committed action and how that, you know, uh, is um, related to your values and being in the present moment, all of them work together to create and hopefully increase psychological flexibility that helps you move forward in your life. So let's boil it down a little bit. Let's get some examples, right? I've talked in kind of um, more academic terms, terms, but let, let's see how this would possibly work. So one common value that a lot of people identify is, is, is talking about having compassion for themselves and for others. And so how do we kind of put 
you know, rubber to the road when it comes to that, when it comes to valued actions in relation to arthritis that was related to that type of value. So one possible example is when my arthritis flares, I'm going to take steps to exhibit self-care, right? So compassion for myself. I'm going to cook healthy meals. I'm going to take a bath whenever I need to. I'm going to value, you know, work on a valued action of taking care of myself and having compassion for myself in those moments, even when it's hard, right? If you remember that acceptance and being able to allow sort of those other things that maybe are not so helpful to, to exist, but still having compassion for yourself. Another value, maintaining a healthy body and mind. And a valued action perhaps that is in service of that value is being able or trying and working on practicing like regular meditation exercises that maybe someone has recommended or the physical therapy recommendations that providers have given you. Being able each time you do that, knowing, okay, this is in service of that value and being able to tie it that action to that value can help make it more salient, help make you more able to follow through and see its importance and kind of keep going with it. So for arthritis specifically, for osteoarthritis, you know, the symptoms are a little bit more consistent. They're kind of there all the time. Maybe an example for this one with work and education, um, which is, you know, more of that industry value to be industrious, hardworking and dedicated, perhaps for specifically OA, maybe being able to volunteer or continuing to work even with current symptoms, right, in some sort of way. And again, with that psychological flexibility, with the acceptance, maybe it doesn't look like what it did before. And, and you know, that might be okay. Um, for inflammatory arthritis, so more kind of that flare-based, it kind of the intensity kind of comes and goes and waves. Um, with the value of supportiveness and how it's related to relationships to be supportive and helpful to myself and others. Maybe an action that's in service of that value is being sort of that good parent or spouse and showing up for others in some sort of way, even during pain flares, right? And again, maybe that looks different. Maybe that doesn't mean that you're able to sit through an entire kid's soccer game, but, but maybe that means that you're able to go for a little bit or that you take the time when they get home to really ask, how did that go? Tell me all about it, right? That you're still able to be there for other people and have pain at the same time. Um, and so what I want to do now is we're going to take a moment. Um, Cheryl has uh, kindly agreed to um, work with me on this part. What we're going to do is we're going to kind of have a little bit of a role play of what <laughs> possibly some uh, act principles put into practice in a psychologist's office might look like. It's important to know that, you know, psychology, uh, mental health uh, treatment, unfortunately, is not widely available to everyone. And this is just a good idea. Maybe gets you thinking about it. Even if you can't see someone, get you start, you know, get those creative juices flowing of maybe how you can look at some things. Also, I fully understand that pain psychologists, we are not common. I have a very odd job in that um, we're a very small tribe. I very small. Um, and so this is possibly the first time anyone's ever heard a pain psychologist say anything, or you probably didn't even know what that was, perhaps, um, that that was a job. And so you can kind of see how that works out a little bit. So that's what we're going to do here. Awesome. I'm excited. This is my first time as well. So let's get into it. <laughs> Great. Um, so, you know, we on in prepping for this, um, there's been some worksheets that you've looked at, yeah. some uh, information that I've given you that talks about different values that lots of people um, have identified um, as being important to them. And I had you pick a couple of them. And so we're going to talk about these. Okay. So the first one you picked is courage, yeah. right? And we have a beautiful definition of it. Um, but I want to know what courage means to you. And especially when it comes to your chronic pain, like how does this play a role in your life? Yeah, I love these definitions because they sound beautiful in theory, but courage is is a difficult one. And that's why I listed it because when I'm dealing with pain, especially um, with people that don't really have a lot of experience with pain, you know, they tend to be just really healthy or maybe they're not talking about it at all. Um, it takes courage to even speak about something that you may identify as a weakness. 
And so that that you have to be vulnerable with people and it can be, uh, it takes courage to, to be vulnerable with people and even with uh, loved ones and people that are close to you. So that's that's how I define courage, being able to find the words, to be vulnerable enough to speak it and talk about something that may be deemed as others as a weakness. Great. I love that you have courage and vulnerability together. I think that's really important. And sometimes we we miss that, right? We think of courage in other ways. I love the vulnerability aspect of it. What about patience? Talk to me about the value of patience and what that means to you. And especially with your arthritis. That's a difficult one. One that I'm still working on, you know, like I mentioned before at the beginning of the webinar, um, I'm a disabled veteran and you know, kind of coming from the space of like the military, you know, go, go, go. Um, I remember one of the terms, uh, pain is a sign of weakness leaving the body. I remember hearing that all the time in basic training. Oh my goodness. And I can laugh about it now, but unconsciously it became part of my belief and value system. So not to get on the tangent, but when I think about patient, uh, patience, it's about me being patient with myself. Um, knowing that I may have to do things differently, even though people may not understand why. I may not understand why, but I know that in some cases, ooh, today is a little different. I can't move as quickly. I need to pace myself. And sometimes that can just be difficult when you you want to be normal, quote unquote. You just want to be normal like everyone else. So patience causes you to slow down and sometimes slowing down can just be difficult. Yes. Being patient with ourselves is sometimes so much more difficult than being patient with other people. Yeah. Um, and it's one of those things that it. what I tell a lot of people is unfortunately struggling to be patient with yourself is a human being problem. And we're not going to solve that, but we can help <laughs> give you some tools so that maybe we can increase that patience. But, oh man, we are never quite as patient with ourselves as maybe we would be helpful to be. Yeah. So what I also want to do, thank you for those, by the way, those were great yeah. examples. Um, let's kind of look at how you're doing in terms yeah. of different areas of your life. So what this is, um, is a worksheet that basically helps you and me see where you think you are um, in your life, kind of with your valued actions in these different areas, right? Okay. And so the examples, we could put anything on this bullseye, but we're using this worksheet um, for right now that divides it into work slash education, personal growth and health, relationships, leisure, and as you've seen before, you get to define whatever that means to you, right? Mm -hmm. But I want to know if you were to see this bullseye and you think, okay, this is where I am in, in acting in accordance with my values in those specific sectors, where do you fall on that? And obviously traditional bullseye right in the middle means you are right on target. You are acting in accordance with your values. The farther away it gets, the farther you think you are in acting with those values. So tell me where you kind of, uh, you think you fall on this. Well, I guess I'll start with like work and education. I feel like I'm pretty good in that area. Um, I also feel pretty good in personal growth and health, not just because I'm a yoga meditation teacher, but I feel like I, I do, um, quote unquote, practice what I preach. So I feel pretty good in those areas. Uh, I probably need some work in leisure um, and relationships are okay. Okay. So take a moment and explain uh, where you think you are with the leisure, why it's so far out compared to the other things. Well, I mean, sometimes I think leisure, um, it can be difficult because it feels like I'm not doing anything. So I sometimes can tend to gravitate towards things that are leisure, but still require some type of effort, maybe like hiking. It's, it's a, it's an activity I enjoy, but if I'm dealing with pain flares, it may not necessarily be something uh, that I'm able to do for a day or for a season. And so sometimes that can be discouraging and I end up just kind of working focusing on relationships and personal um, growth and health 
but not really taking time to be intentional about leisure activities um, with my everyday life. Uh, and sometimes, you know, just, just to be honest, when it comes to leisure, I feel like sometimes I'm down with a pain flare for so long that what do I need leisure for? I just kind of laid around for two days. So yeah. do I deserve to, you know, just kind of have some activities? Um, it's kind of more so once I'm back up, let's go back to work. Let's do some other things. So it's definitely something I want to work on. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like the two areas where you feel maybe you would benefit from focusing on at least right now is sort of that leisure aspect and then a little bit uh, with the relationships. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's go to the next one. So let's talk about um, some different scenarios in which you see this um, come to play in real life, um, like the pro personal growth and health type area. Okay. What's a scenario that you think you struggle with here? Um, I think I struggle with being vulnerable, as I mentioned before, and when I have unexpected pain flares, um, just when I've been pain-free for a while, which tends to happen to me, I don't know about other people's experiences, but I can go like weeks, sometimes months, and I feel great. And then out of the blue will be um, an unexpected flare. And just knowing how to handle that, because it's almost like I return to normal for a time and now unexpectedly I'm not normal anymore. And I so desperately just want to be normal. Yeah. So that, that, um, that's, that's a difficult one. Okay. So we talked about some of the values that are important to you and we kind of picked courage and patience. Yes. How would you apply that value of start with courage mm -hmm. in that situation how do you think you can be courageous and in a pain flare and I'm going to take I'm going to mm -hmm. I'm going to interrupt myself and you just for a second okay and 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 just because I think it's important I use the word and very very strategically because and inherently kind of foster well the goal is that it can foster some acceptance mm -hmm. that it you don't have to wait for the pain flare to go away right. before you can be courageous. So how can you be courageous and in a pain flare? Oh man, I, I think this is a tough one, Dr. Black. I think that I can be a little bit more courageous while I'm dealing with the pain, which is impacting how I feel, how I interact with others is um, in that moment to just accept what it is in the moment, understanding that this, this may not be my reality for the next moment, but for right now, I can be courageous and say, this is where I am right now. Yeah. And I'm still able to live life and do things in a different way and, and continue to move forward versus kind of just shutting down. Completely. Let's go ahead and populate this a little bit. Yeah. Um, similar question. Patient and in a pain flare. How can you be patient during or and in a pain flare? Uh, how can I be patient? Um, allow myself the grace to just slow down. To just slow down and say, I'm hurting right now. I'm really hurting. And to just be in that space and just maybe take a moment to sit down and just take a breath. Sometimes when I'm in a pain flare, I just try to pause for a moment and do like a breathing meditation, like two, three minutes. Just to acknowledge what's happening yeah. on the inside yeah. right now. So I think that's that's a way that I've been able to gain more patience with myself by pausing or either just kind of slowing down for a moment, and just sit down, <laughs> catch yeah. my breath. Um, yeah, that's 
that's one of the things that I'm able to do. And I think I can apply it to, you know, when it comes to personal growth, being able to do that now as someone that's lived with pain for a number of years, I wasn't able to do that in the beginning when I was younger. So I was diagnosed with osteoarthritis when I was like late twenties, early thirties. So back, back during my early days, I would just act like it wasn't happening. Like, yeah. oh, this, this is an old person's thing. It's not happening. And I would just muscle through it, fight through it. Now I'm at a point where I value my body in a way that I understand it may better serve me just to recognize what I'm feeling right now and to be okay with it in the moment instead of acting like it's not happening. Yeah. That must have taken a lot of, but honestly, patience and courage within yourself to dismantle kind of that narrative, like you talked about from the military of yeah. go, 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 white knuckle this sucker. You can just you're just not trying hard enough. Yes. <laughs> that, that must have been a lot of work on your part. I didn't realize I was doing a lot of work at the time, but it really has like taken years. I mean, for the yeah. first few years, I would, when I would have pain flares, I would just act like it wasn't happening. Yeah. Literally just be in pain and just continuing to do things, work and activities like I normally do. And then just at the end of the day, just crying, depressed, body in pain, um, shielding myself and isolating myself from others after it all, you know, at the end, it kind of comes crashing down. What it sounds like is you were using a strategy such as go, go, go yeah. that worked for you in the past, mm -hmm. but at one point it no longer served the purpose. Yeah. It definitely didn't work anymore. Dr. Black. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it didn't work anymore. And that's why I always like to point that out though, is you weren't doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. You were just using a set of skills that worked in the past that were no longer applicable to the life that you had at that moment. Right. right. And so being able to accept that these strategies no longer work can help you try some different strategies. And it sounds like it's, it's been helpful Yes. to be courageous, to be patient and have a pain flare. Yes. So let's talk about another one. Let's talk about another situation. So we can go to the next one. Give me a scenario when it comes to leisure, <laughs> relationships, things like that, that maybe we're struggling a little bit with. Yeah, definitely struggling with, you know, just being able to, as I mentioned before, be vulnerable with people when going through a pain flare because on the outside, people are like, oh, you look fine. You look great. Yeah. Um, And just trying to, having to explain is very daunting and sometimes it's hard to find the words because what people see is not they don't feel what you're feeling and so it's just easier sometimes to say um something like oh I'm just not having a good day um or something generic where people yeah. really still don't understand what's going on they may think that someone made you upset but no you're your, your body is in physical pain. Yeah. I hear this a lot, right? Chronic pain, many chronic pain conditions, they're not visible. Yes, they're not. To ever. <laughs> and so many people with chronic pain conditions have learned how to look normal right. when they don't feel so normal, right? And it creates yeah. a lot of confusion. So thinking about that value of courage, right? Mm -hmm. How does this apply to you? I mean, you know, I think it's sometimes it's a, to be honest, sometimes it's a little easier to explain it to someone that may not be as close to you, not necessarily a stranger, but sometimes your closest family members and friends, they think they know you so well. And if you try to explain it, and sometimes if you don't get the response you think you're going to get, I feel like I kind of like cower down, like I didn't really explain it so well, but I think that having the courage to explain it in a way that makes sense for me. So maybe using language that I'm familiar with, with, um, you know, hey, I know that I said that I would, you know, go hang out or go to coffee. Um, today's just not a good day for me. That's kind of one of the things that I say, maybe to people that aren't so close to me or don't know my situation. 
And then having the courage and being vulnerable with family members that think they know you the best to say, hey, I know that I was going to participate in this thing, but um, I have a flair today and I, I just can't do it. I, I just I just can't do it. So with family members and close friends that that do have some sense of what's going on, most people seem to kind of understand a flare. And I just say I, I'm having a flare. I, I just I, I can't do it. Yeah. And what about? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No. And I I think I think people understand on some level, even if not fully. But I think being being having courage is to just maybe leave it there and don't expect i've i've stopped expecting people to fully understand like if they just understand i can't do this today and and that's fine that's all they need to understand they don't need to understand the full write up of yep. my diagnosis just not today yep yep if you want to talk about we can talk about this later but not today I think that's great, right? The courage to also say like, this is about me and I don't need to necessarily disclose all my stuff. Exactly. To you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what about patience? How does patience play a role with this? I mean, like I mentioned before, you know, sometimes you, ex you, you want a nice compassionate response and sometimes you don't get it <laughs> and just yeah. being patient with people that they don't necessarily know how you feel and that if you don't get that response that seems supportive to just, you know, just be patient with people and to know that everyone just doesn't have a framework for what you're going through. They they just don't. I don't think people are necessarily trying to be mean or or not be empathetic. It's just they may not understand. So giving them the grace and the patience yeah. that when you tell them something, they're like, oh, okay, I don't. I thought you were fine yesterday. Just, just, yeah. uh, just giving them the grace that they can only understand what they can understand today. And how fortunate of them that they don't really get it. Cause that means that maybe they don't experience it. Right. right. So they get a, they get a body that doesn't do things that yours does, right. The funky stuff that maybe you would yeah. rather not be with. And I think you make a really good point that in these times when you're talking to friends and family, you know, thinking about what information you want to give them, mm -hmm. but then giving up the other half of the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. They will react however they will react, but you can't control that, right? And mm -hmm. so as long as you can feel confident and secure, and this is the information that I really want this person to know, mm -hmm. are you able to accept that you can only do your half of the conversation and then they react however they react. And then you can kind of take it from there. But you're right. That can be extremely difficult yeah. to not to have that conversation and not get the response hope that you were maybe hoping mm -hmm. for. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, only patient to a certain degree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do. Mm -hmm. Some people are not always um, fantastic. And while that's unpleasant, that is an acceptance piece as well, right? Right. Can you walk away and sh you get to be annoyed, you get to be angry, you get to be whatever you are, because those emotions are real, but you also get to say, and I choose not to put my efforts yes. in that emotion. It's a balance uh, there. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so similarly to scenario one, how do they apply, how how does this move forward, right? Like how do how do these valued actions get you moving forward because that's one of the main principles that we're trying to work on here i think that when you're in the midst of the flare it, you, you just have to kind of remember it and put it into practice so it can become your your new tried and true strategy sometimes the the pain is so overwhelming i tell my husband all the time and he he, he deals with uh rheumatoid arthritis so we both have our own mm -hmm. issues but i say sometimes I miss so much pain. I feel like I can't even think. I, I just, yeah. I can't even think straight. All I can do is just lay down and just close my eyes. Um, but I think that it can be applied to, you know, as an area of growth and just being mindful that there are tools that we can use 
in the midst of a flare that life doesn't stop. Yeah. Or as you mentioned before, that we don't have to wait until the flare is over. So that's one thing that I, I've really taken from the webinar that you can live during the flare. You don't have to wait until it's over. You can slow down, but you don't have to just check out and isolate yeah. during the flare. When you kind of learn how to accept it using the tools that we're talking about. Awesome. Yeah. So let's go move forward. Thank you so much. Those were <laughs> You're the, the perfect person for me to talk to about this. <laughs> I love it. Um, so some other things talking about, you know, we can use these skills, right? We can talk about it. We can work on acceptance. We can move towards value actions. We can do all of these things, but the best laid plans, right? Yes. Um, sometimes things get off track. They definitely do. And so what can be helpful is being able to use some other skills that help basically just kind of ground us, center us, and get us back to that present moment right now, even with the pain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so some just things that you can actually do, deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, different types of meditation, mindfulness meditation, walking meditation, you know, when we're not in our... Um, uh, uh, fake scenario here, you know, way more meditations than I will ever know. So you can <laughs> add to this. There's one for every person, right? Yeah. Um, there's different things that you can do as well as I think sometimes we undervalue distraction, right? True. We, when we are not feeling good and the flare or the pain is just like, oh, that's all we can keep on our brains. It's all we can think about. It's all we can talk about. Mm -hmm. Distraction is not a terrible thing. Right. I think it gets a bad rap, but in the short term for some things is extremely beneficial. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I use that too. Are there things you can do that can kind of take your mind somewhere else? Doesn't yes. and accept that your pain is still there mm -hmm. and you're going to hurt whether you do the distracting activity or not. So can you find something that you enjoy that's distracting mm -hmm. even when you have the pain? Yeah. Right give your brain something else to focus on. And I, I found, I found that like mindfulness meditation, specifically yoga Nidra mm -hmm. is really, really good because um, I have mainly focused pain uh, in my neck and my spine. So with no yoga Nidra, when the guide is taking you through bringing awareness to your toes, your fingers, your knees, your legs, it helps me to remember, Oh, but I'm dealing with pain in my back, but my fingers feel good. My wrists feel good. And so it does allow you to um, shift your perspective, shift your focus to other parts of your body so that um, you don't develop this uh, kind of negative attitude towards your body. That is, yeah. it's not there for you. It's not strong, but there are other areas that are, that are strong, that feel good in the midst of the pain flare. So that's been a, a great one for me. That's great. I think that's yeah. wonderful. Um, so lots of different techniques in the moment. Yeah. Um, and then just one little reminder here, um, when things get tough, when your pain, when we use this in sort of act and other types of pain focused psychotherapy, you got your pain voice and you got your <laughs> wise voice, right? Um, when your pain voice is screaming, this is the worst, you'll never get past it. Life is no longer what it used to, you know, all of these real mm -hmm. negative things, remembering that those are thoughts. They are unpleasant. We do not care for them at times, but they are thoughts. They are not inherent truth. They are not necessarily what you need to use to guide your life, right? They are thoughts mm -hmm. and they will come and they will go and they're pretty powerful at times. But guess what? Other thoughts about my wrist doesn't hurt. This feels pretty good. Those are powerful thoughts too, right? Okay. And so, um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, You're welcome. So really quickly, just a little summary of things. Um, so there are certain things about having a chronic health condition that are out of your control. Like I just, it just is what it is. Um, but there are still things that are in your control and it's, very important to remember that 
in the face of the stuff that's not in your control to say, yep, okay, I'm not happy about that. And here, here's where I can do that. I accept that this is here. And by accepting that, it kind of frees you up to then also look at the other stuff, right? We're not n n pretending like this doesn't exist, right? Like just Sherelle said at first, she was saying like, I just, I pretended like it wasn't happening. Well, that wasn't helping anything. By acknowledging that it's happening, it kind of gives you the freedom to try other strategies, right? So acceptance can help open you up, like I said, to those new strategies or modifications that can help you live a more valued life. Um, and remembering too, you talked a lot, we talked a lot about acceptance. Um, it is not a static concept, right? Some days you're gonna be able to do that acceptance thing a little bit better than others. And some days, so not, not so. It is not an on-off switch. It's a dial, right? It's like a volume knob. It's like a one of the um, light switches that's more like a you know dimmer switch. It's going to change from day to day. It's going to change from moment to moment. It's okay, right? It becomes sort of this like layered thing of can you accept when you are struggling to accept, right? Which see, it kind of gets off the rails and seems a little... Whew, a lot for some people and very meta, but it's true, right? It's normal that some days you're going to be like, nope, I am not cool with this. I'm not accepting it. I'm really struggling. That's okay, right? It's normal. It's okay. You're not doing it wrong. Some days are just harder than others and that's okay. I think we are opening it up to any questions. Yes, we, we are going to open it up for questions. Um, so for those that have questions about anything that we've discussed, anything that uh, Dr. Black has mentioned, this is your opportunity to list your questions in the Q&A chat. And we will be monitoring the chat just to see what questions come in. Uh, Sherelle, thanks for sharing your experience with osteoarthritis. I unfortunately have osteoarthritis myself. You're right, you have to accept arthritis, but I can't let it run my whole life. That's wonderful, Katie. <laughs> but, um, one we can address, you know, how do you deal with well-meaning family or friends who give unhelpful advice about arthritis? You know, this one is, this one definitely comes up a lot where it's like, well, my cousin Joe has arthritis and he, he just took some turmeric and he's fine. Won't you try that? Or yeah, I think we've all heard things like that. What do you recommend with that when it comes to the acceptance commitment therapy? Um, what I tend to tell people is you get to, it's your health, it's your life. So you get to kind of decide your script for this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and being able to accept that they truly are probably trying to help, right? They're not trying to give you purposely bad advice, um, but accepting that and then having some patience and just saying, you get to decide, thank you. you and, and, and so many options. You can say, thank you. And then just leave it at that. <laughs> you can say, I'm not sure I've ever heard about that. Perhaps I could look into it. I'm glad it helped uncle so-and-so or whatever the example is. Yeah. Or you could go the other route and say, yeah, that's not for me. Like you get to, you get to drive the bus. You get to decide how you respond. But I think making sure it can be helpful to remind yourself that they likely are coming from a good place. They just are perhaps wildly off base. Okay. Yes, that's definitely, I think a lot of us can identify with that. People kind of, well, sometimes given unsolicited help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh gosh. Um, another question here is, Oh, they're really coming in now. Uh, one question is where can where can someone find the workbooks that you mentioned about ACT? So there are a number of ACT workbooks. There are ACT workbooks that are just general ACT um, that are not focused on chronic pain. Um, but so that the typical one is, uh, or the kind of like the biggest one is called Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life by Steve Hayes. Um, that is, I actually probably have it at my desk, honestly, right in front of me. Um, that is one. There is also a chronic pain act workbook. I can't remember out of, um, right off the top of my head who writes that, but oh. there are a number of them that you honestly can find them on Amazon, oh. but there are different act for chronic pain, self-guided work 
books. Um, but there's a couple of different people um, that are kind of in that realm where you can where you can find that. Okay, so yes, the at worksheet will be in your reminder email, and it will also be in the survey that you you'll receive after this webinar. So that is something great that you can look forward to. So make sure that you're looking out for uh, that email and that survey that will have the act worksheet available. Mm -hmm. Another question that came in, what's the best breathing techniques for distraction and where to learn them? I'm going to let you field that one. I feel like that one's yeah. <laughs> very so, within your mobile. <laughs> breathe, breathing techniques all have their own unique uh, benefits and whatnot, but I, I would dare to say that a breathing technique is designed to distract you. What a breathing technique or a breathing exercise or meditation exercise can do is more so shift your awareness to your breath and to other um just shift your awareness to your breath. Um, can you call it distracting the pain? I guess you could, but it allows you to just really bring focus awareness kind of to your respiratory system and how your body is breathing with you. I always like to tell my students that it's not just you breathing, but your body is also breathing with you. And in the midst of that breathing is the pain but the pain is is also a part of, of the breathing. And so it's just an opportunity. A simple breathing technique is uh, called square breathing. You breathe in for a count of four. Some people call it circle breathing. And you just inhale for a count of four, hold the breath for four and exhale and release for a count of four. And we, we have a few minutes. So I'm just gonna lead us through two rounds as you sit up nice and tall. And from your low belly, take a deep breath in for four. Three, two, one, and hold. Four, three, two, one, release. Four, three, two, one, inhale. Four, three, two, one, and hold. Four, three, two, one, exhale. Four, three, two, one, relax. Four, three, two, one. So of course, whoever is guiding you or you're guiding yourself, you're just trying to bring some awareness and calmness to your mind and your body. It doesn't mean the pain will go away, but you will notice that your pain ebbs and flows and it's not always at 10. You may notice as you bring conscious awareness to your breathing, it ebbs from 10 to eight, to eight to nine, nine to five. And that awareness lets you know that this is not a static a uh, permanent position that you're in, but pain comes and it goes. So let's see, next question, where do I find an ACT therapist and will insurance cover it? So in some insurances cover mental health um, uh, treatments such as therapy to differing degrees, right? So some more, some less, some not at all. Um, but you're, but it is considered a psychotherapy. So if you have psychotherapy coverage, it will cover act because it's not different. It's still the same, uh, like billing codes, um, to find an act therapist. I wish I had a better answer than if you want insurance to cover it, you can go through and you can find, um, lists of providers that are covered under your insurance. Um, you can go to your insurance website and they can kind of show you those, and then psychology today is one resource where you can go and you can look for those providers and on those, um, those lists or those websites, they can say what things they specialize in. And a number of people, if they specialize in ACT, will will list that. Um, or if that particular provider has a website, they will sometimes act. Uh, show that. Mm -hmm. What I will say is as you do this, sometimes you'll see people are certified in this and certified in that, and that's great, but there is no ACT certification. Um, that was one of the guiding principles with ACT is that they didn't want to restrict um, mm -hmm. who could get this training. So there is no real like ACT certification. Um, there you go. I think there's a, someone was able to show uh, a link. That's great. I just saw that. Okay. Um, yeah. Awesome. This is another great question. Maybe both of us can address this and hopefully Robin will keep us set on time. The person uh, says, I have a hard time when people pity me when I explain my pain or flare ups, like they just don't know how to help. So they get quiet and awkward. 
What can I say to remain in my power and not feel pitied? It's a great question. I kind of want to hear if you have any thoughts about that as someone with a real lived experience of this. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can't, as we just talked about, you can't control the way people respond to you when you share something. Um, but I do think that you can remain in your power and not necessarily try to justify so they're like oh poor thing you don't have to say oh no but you know I'm feeling a little bit better you don't have to go there but I think that you can keep yourself empowered by saying things like you know yeah to, to today you know is not the best day but you know I'm I'm confident and I'm happy you know to be here and where I am today, letting that person know that this pain isn't taking over your whole life, although you may have to move a little bit slower, um, that you're still grateful. So I think gratitude plays a part into it. You can share as much or as little as you like um, when that person, you know, says, oh, you know, something like, you know, poor thing. And it's like, well, you know, I, I appreciate you understanding. But despite that, I'm just so glad to be here in this moment with you. I'm so glad to be able to continue doing some of the tasks that I have today. And that can kind of counter that uh, with gratitude. I love that. I love that you shifted the narrative a little bit too. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need Try to focus to. on that. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I don't think we need to focus on that aspect of it. Look mm -hmm. at how, you know, I'm so glad that I can be here and that I, I love that. I would give no different of a response. I okay. think that's great. Awesome. Another question is Dr. Black, would you go back to the brain processing and describe how taking valued actions help deal with the psychological pain? Okay. Um, so talking about the brain processing with, um, acute pain, I kind of talked about what I didn't do was talk about sort of where that goes off track with the chronic pain, um, which is on me. So let me kind of talk about that. But with, with the physiological sensations of pain, the idea is if you have like an acute injury or something, the sensation goes throughout your body through these sort of, um, neural networks, the nervous system, and then, um, goes around a couple of different areas of your brain and then, and then creates a pain sensation that's associated with your toe. Um, and so those areas in which the brain recruits to decide, um, what that pain sensation is going to be, how much it's going to hurt the, you know, the different sensations too. Sometimes it's burning, sometimes it's ache, it's different sensations. Um, some of those brain areas that get involved are also involved in emotion processing, um, uh, with, uh, fear, danger networks, things like that. And so being able, and then, and then the, the sensation of pain is created and then, and then your toe hurts or whatever. What happens in chronic pain, and especially with conditions like arthritis, is that system kind of gets worked so much, right? That pain goes and comes and comes and comes that the feedback loop system kind of gets shorted out. And so what happens is those pain sensations grow over time, even if in your specific case, the arthritis has not progressed technically, um, it, then your, your pain can get worse because those neural pathways just get really, really big and strong. And so what can it, with when it comes to valued actions, what can be important and can be helpful is that um, you can learn to to, you know, I got this pain, this is what's going on physiologically. And how do I still do the things to some degree that I want to do? And honestly, as we see people are able to kind of do those things and re-engage with their life, move towards valued actions, it kind of tamps down the nervous system a little bit. And it's not quite as reactive. You still have pain, like that obviously doesn't go away. But that nervous system overactivity actually tends to go down a little bit um, whenever you're able to engage in your life a little bit more effectively, able to do some meditation exercises, able to do that stuff um, kind of helps with that. It's we call it top down processing. Thank you for explaining that, Dr. Black. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of great questions, but I think I'm going to check in really quick to see if we OK, we have one last question. So. Um, we appreciate everyone's questions. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time um, to go into all of them. Uh, the question regard is regarding uh, cognitive diffusion. diffusion. Yes. Diffusion, yeah. If you can address that. Yeah. Cognitive me. diffusion um, is basically the idea of separating yourself from your thoughts and your feelings. Right. So remember how at the end um, on sort of that takeaway slide was remember that you're not your thoughts. 
cognitive diffusion is just that concept that your thoughts can be kind of separate from you. You don't have to buy them. You don't have to, you know, be stuck in it. You can actually kind of think about it a little bit separately. Um, the example that they give or the experiential exercise they tend to use to explain this is if you say the word milk over and over and over again, it's sort of like after a while, it just doesn't sound like milk. Like it's just sounds and it's weird. <laughs> if you just say milk, 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 it sounds weird to you. And it's that idea of like all of a sudden that kind of has lost its meaning and now you just see it for what it is instead of like the representation of milk. Um, and so that's the idea of cognitive diffusion is just being able to take a step back and away um, from those thoughts instead of joining them and sort of being in it with it. Thank you for that explanation. I think that question came up uh, at least twice. So we're we're gonna put a pin in it right there. <laughs> I'm going through the chat. There, there's still some other questions, but I hope that the questions that were um, answered uh, provided you with um, with an answer, but also with some tools and maybe some things to just kind of think about um, as you ponder this. Um, some of the questions that came up were about the webinar. So uh, reiterating again that the webinars will be uh, available for replay on the Arthritis Foundation's YouTube page. And you can also go to the Arthritis Foundation uh, webinar page and you can check out this webinar and all the other webinars. So the replays are available, um, but as it relates to that ACT worksheet, it will be available in your email um, when you receive the survey for the course. All right, so Dr. Black, we wanna thank you so much. I've learned so much today. Uh, it's been a great, this has been a great webinar to really start the new year. And as you mentioned, we don't have to just do this for the new year. We can do it throughout in the spring, in the summer, next month. And so it's not just tied to January. So thank you for providing us with all these great tools and tips to just help us um, as we, as all of us are living with chronic pain and how we uh, interact with ourselves and each other. So thank you. Any, any parting words before? Just thank you so much for including me. I love this, if you can't tell. Um, so I, I tell. really enjoy talking about this stuff. So thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Black. Many people have been asking about this all night. We have upcoming events with the Arthritis Foundation. You can, some people have already signed up for connect groups. Kudos to you. I love it. Um, there are various opportunities where you can get connected, where you can um, meet other people that are living with chronic pain and feel supported. Uh, you can sign up for a connect group. Of course, all the webinars are available on the website. The next one coming up is Healthy Eating Made Easy for Arthritis. So we know that nutrition is a big part of our lives, especially for those of us living with chronic pain. So we want to offer that webinar to you as well as Joyful Movement, Easy on the Joint. Points. That's the next webinar in the month of March. So make sure that you stay connected, that you are on the mailing list for the Arthritis Foundation so that you can get these great resources and not just keep them for yourself, share them with your family and friends. And to Dr. Black's point, for those that you feel like are empathetic to your situation, they want to better understand you, maybe share these webinars with family or friends so they can hear for themselves. We also have the Walk to Cure that's going to be coming up, the annual arthritis walks. We also, uh, there's a podcast uh, where you can just listen. Maybe you're not into video, but you can just listen through audio about all of the um, the updates and technologies and new therapies as it relates to arthritis. And we also have a helpline. If you need help and you just have questions, whether it's health-related, insurance-related, uh, you can definitely call the 1-800 hotline. And don't forget about the survey. The survey will be provided to you via email for those that registered. And we would love your feedback. We'd love to hear more about your thoughts on this webinar this evening. It's been my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today. This is near and dear to my heart. And I hope that you all are able to rest easy with this new information and that this new information will provide you with a uh, great foundation for continuing to live even while in the midst of a pain flare. And so we'll close out. Good night, everyone, and rest easy.